you again for receiving us here and celebrating us. I don't take it for granted. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read a very important verse of scripture, Isaiah chapter 60, and I'm going to speak from that. I will say some things that may sound be of some of the theology that are popular out there, but they won't be new and they'll be true. So don't judge with all judgment, try to learn. Um, I've been doing this thing for over 20 years by the grace of God. Um, I know this work, God is helping me. And we are speaking, helping, counseling, advising at very high levels. Um, I can tell you some things that are going on in the world today and how you have to position ourselves as Christians. Um, there are some things you don't confront with determination, you confront with clarity. When we know better, we do better. There's a type of intelligence that is required to stay in some moments. You know, a lot of determination are useless without clarity. You know, you can't be confident. There's something called confident ignorance. You know, you don't know anything, but you are not aware. And by some silly assumption, you've placed yourself on a pedestal you don't belong to. And then you are just trying to use raw energy to bash your way through a movement that requires sharpness and clarity. You will be stranded. Some people say don't give up. Well, it's true on many levels, but for, to motivational speakers, it's one of the truest statements ever said. But to scripture, you must know giving up is a skill in scripture. The Bible says there's time for everything. A time to hold on and the time to give up as lost. It's motivational speakers that say don't give up. If you don't give up on what God is not backing up, you are going to give up the ghost. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> you won't give up still, but you give up the ghost. Some things are inelastic. They can't stretch. And clarity tells you that, and so you behave. They say, let sleeping dog lie. It makes sense. It makes it, but not by your side. That's what I add to it. Because you don't know what the dog is dreaming about. You don't know how hungry the dog is, and your leg just smells like bone, man. So let the dog lie for real, but let it lie at a distance where its nuisance, whims, and caprices cannot touch your own resolve, right? That's, those are the kind of things you have to embrace in the world that we live in today. See, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Well, maybe, but that's assuming the tough knows the way. Because if he doesn't know the way, he's just going to keep going and get, and get lost. When the going gets tough, the tough seeks collaboration. To collaboration, we turn every time. Nobody is self-made, man. We are all products of influences. And we have to learn to collaborate. And when debt is sure, retirement is guaranteed, and you are the departure lounge of life ready to take the, the flight, your entire life be proportional to people, places, and events. The people you met, the people you allowed, the people you gave access to, and those you denied access. The geographies you allowed yourself to experience, or the ones you denied yourself from experiencing, and the moments in those geographies. That's, that's the human life right there, people, places, and events. You will never prosper beyond the people you allowed in your life, or you denied access into your life. The geographies you permitted yourself to see and the ones you did not see. The moments that the universe will visit you with, the ones you embrace and the ones you ignore. That's life. The contents of your legacy, the wealth of your peace at twilight is determined by those three things. People, places, and events. I'm going to zero in on all of that as I journey on this conversation. And God will help us in Jesus' name. Open your Bible real quick, real quick to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah in chapter 60. Um, I'm going to read from verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now that's just not happening. That's happening because darkness are covered yet. I just rephrased it because that's the meaning of four. That, that word for that you saw there, that's the meaning. I'll take it again. So I'm going to be replacing some words in contemporary terms. But so I'm, I'm writing my, I'm reading my version of this scripture. This is my version. 
but it's the same scripture. So just follow me. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now because of that, just because the glory of God is risen upon you, the why to that is because darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But none of that has nothing to do with you negatively. Darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the people. You should expect that because that is the prophecy that I give to you as your God. My plan for you is I rise over you and my glory will be seen upon you. And then the effect of that is that Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So you lift up your eyes around about and see see what is going on not just what is happening because what is happening is the legacy of the majority what is going on is the privilege of their leaders their masters even their slave masters and their oppressors so lift up your eyes and see they all gather to you they come to you your son shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the seed shall be turned to you, the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you, and the multitude of camels shall cover your land, the Demetrius of Midian and Ephah, and all those from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense, they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord, and all the flocks of Kira shall gather together to you, the rams of Neboah shall minister to you, they shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these who fly like a cloud, like doves to their roots? Surely the coastland shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish shall come first. To bring your sons from afar. To bring your sons from afar. They don't come empty handed. You can even discern the character of your sons by their positioning. Because these sons come with silver and gold with them, not poverty and stress. They come, so those are not your sons in this regard for this conversation. The sons that are coming from afar are not coming with stress and needs and poverty and pain and discomfort. That's not what they are coming with. These ones are coming with gold and silver to the name of the Lord your God. Because really, because everyone is waving at the rider on the donkey is an assumption. It's an assumption. When everybody is waving at the rider and the donkey, we still have to decide who they are waving at, whether it's the donkey or it's the rider. For Jesus entered Jerusalem, it was a rider. The donkey would be a fool to assume it was the attention. It would be a big fool. So let's be clear. As children of God, we are donkeys. Our rider is our maker. It's never about you. And every resource coming into your life is not to make you comfortable. It's to expand God's kingdom. We miss that every time. We think that God is about your shoes, your clothes, your house, so that at 40 you can have a house of your own, and that's your testimony. Tomorrow we're going to deal with some of that. A car is not a testimony. If you testify that you bought a car, it's okay, it comforts your soul, but you are small. Go fools buy that car. People who don't go to church at all, atheists buy the same car. Right? Agnostics buy the same car. Muslims buy the same car. Without cheating, without robbing. Superior customer care, market penetration, product development, market segmentation. They make the money all day long. It's our years in poverty that comforts us to receive a car as a testimony of God's grace. We have to transcend such smallness and begin to see the world as it is. And that is why the one who changed the world, turned it upside down, lives inside of us. And all he can do is buy perfumes and artificial air and, and, and trainers and buy cars and give you houses. Like, I've been privileged to, count, to counsel and to consult for six billionaires. And when I say billionaires, I mean billionaires in any currency. They are not, they are not Christians, not one. I mean, if you meet Bill Gates, what do you say to him? How do you minister to him? This is your year. 
What are you going to say? You will make it. What are you going to say? No, I'm asking you. If you meet Elon Musk, what are you going to say? This is, this is your time. Or, 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 you're, going to, you're going to make it. What are you going to say? That is when you realize that your message all this while and your theology has been geographical, limited to the ignorance of your own people. And the God of the universe struggles to send messages to you because essentially you are blinded and defeated by your history of pain. And so you interpret the God of the universe by the relief he gives you on the condition of your own pain. And God is bigger than your struggle. Come on. So please. It's a shift. There are, there are four trajectories in expanding yourself. There's the what. There's the why. There's the how and there's the what next. Every time you try to articulate something end to end, you pretty much have to see those four. What is the energy of clarity? Why is the energy of motivation? You really have to know why you are doing what you're doing. Most people don't live beyond what. The best of people try to live around the what and the why. But again, you have to transcend into the how and how is the spirit of innovation. What next is the spirit of domination? Because that is inventive. How is one to infinity? What next is zero to one? Zero to one thinking is what created the world. The world was created out of nothing. You can't innovate except there's something else on ground. Everybody thinks China will take over the world except the Chinese himself. China can never take over the world. Because China lives in one to infinity type of thinking. The countries who rule the world don't live in one to infinity. They live in zero to one. They create something out of nothing. That's the energy of creation. And the Chinese preserve his culture arrogantly. There's nobody that will dominate the world that will not share his culture with the world and receive the culture of the world to his own reality. You see what I'm saying? We all wear suits everywhere in the world today because of about how many hundreds of years rule of the British Empire. That's why we drink tea everywhere. Our homes are filled with salads because of the legacy of the Greek Empire. We eat pizza and have um, pasta and all of that as the legacy of the Roman Empire. Are we together? If your food can't scale, your music cannot scale, your fashion cannot scale, your language cannot scale, your currency will never scale, you can never be a superpower. You'll be a prosperous nation, but you can't be a superpower. African food is scaling, just in case you don't know. Our music is scaling, it's just that leaders are blind to see the, the natural elements that God is stamping on the universe without our permission. And Afrobeat is everywhere right now. It's a major thing. If China can have that, it will be the greatest clue to their dominance. But our, our, our music is scaling, right? And our government don't see. Uh, Jollof rice is becoming a major menu. You know, all, all we need is for a sound, intelligent, futuristic chef to just go strike a partnership with, with Chef Ramsey and run a show on jollof rice, and that's it. The world begins to consume it. But we don't get it because our reality, most of the time, is to find comfort outside in as opposed to inside out. And outside in type of thinking conditions you into a block that impresses your own soul and that of your immediate family and few friends. Outside think, outside out think, inside out thinking is the type that really arrests your own capacity, gives it, defines all its power, and then you use all of that to multiply value in the world, right? So Jesus did not happen outside in, Jesus happened inside out. And we have to master that. That's what scripture is saying here. Um, please stay with me. So he says, to the name of the Lord your God, that's why all of this is happening. To the name of the Lord your God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. He has glorified you for a reason. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls. The sons of foreigners, not your own people. This diaspora thing that you guys are part of, you need to understand his prophetic dimension and his destiny-sensitive instrument. You have to. You just can't be in London handing pounds. There's a reason why you are here. God sent you here. And you can't be like the past generation 
who came here locked in survival. I said it again and I will say it here. Nigerians don't live abroad, even though we have millions of them abroad. Africans don't live abroad, even though we have millions abroad. Nigerians live in Nigeria inside abroad. So, so Nigerians don't live in the UK, for example. Nigerians live in Nigeria inside the UK. Nigerians live in Nigeria inside America. Nigerians live in Nigeria inside Canada. That's how we live. Africans live in Africa inside America. And when you do that, the best dividend that follows you is success, not power. You have a lot of money in the bank at best on real estate, and that's it. The system can take you out with a wink. In 1993, Nigeria was taught a very important lesson. It was a very powerful, prophetic lesson. But I'm now very clear that most of us missed it. It was a battle between money and power. And money and power went to war. Money was represented by a gentleman called M.K. Wabiola. Incredible visionary, by the way. One of the Africans I've ever, I respect the most in my life. Power was represented by a gentleman called um, General Ibrahim Babangida. So they went to war. Money won the battle in that money won the war. Money won the battle because money won the election, sorry. Yeah. But power won the war. Power came back to, first of all, annul the election, mm -hmm. then arrested money, mm -hmm. then jailed money, mm -hmm. then killed money, and nothing happened. <laughs> Which was bequeathed, bequeathed to buy power so that the powerless can feel important. The average northerner wakes up in the morning clear. Doesn't want to go to a bank, doesn't want to work in an oil and gas firm. He wants to work in the police force or the civil service or the army. Because you understand power. Once you have power, you never lack money. You can have a lot of money and not have power. As a matter of fact, when you are powerful, everybody with money are keeping it for you. It's really yours. That's just your bank. So in Nigeria, for example, just case study. The Northerners are not really interested in being billionaires or millionaires. You can have all that pride. You can build all the banks. You can build all the institutions, own all the companies. You are just custodians. When power is ready, it takes what it wants. The Lord your God, there's no documentation in scripture that says God is successful. <laughs> Go and check it. As he is, so you are on earth. Yes. Success is not, it's not your power in the kingdom. Power is. It's all power. All. Not some, not a few. In heaven and earth has been given to you. And to me. We need to be clear. In my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be open not once in a while. Not eight to five. Not nine to five. Your gates shall not be open nine to five. Your gates shall be open continually. Now the only way you can do this, to have your gates open continually is online. Even if you have a 24 hour store in London, if it's not online, the guys in New York cannot see or buy in it. So 24 hours is not just opening geographically, it's opening borderlessly. Being borderless, stay with me, or to discuss in the future, so. They shall not be shut day or night. Your gates, so what kind of gates are you running? Gates that close at five and nobody can reach you and you feel cool that you are running a business. You are around, you are not present. When you are present, your gates are open continually. Day or night, they are never shut. Amazon. 
That's what Amazon is doing. It doesn't matter what, if Jeff Bezos is sleeping, the doors of Amazon are open 247 continually in every country. Completely borderless. They've taken out the middleman. I'm going to get there. Because if you want to be, you want to be a billionaire, you have, to take out, you have to learn how to take out the middleman. Call it DoorDash, call it Uber, call it Twitter. The middleman is the guy you must take out. Self to choose your own emotion so you are small. When you are strong, it's inside out. It means you don't have to like me, but you will respect me. And that comes from the habitual application of principles. Regardless of what your environment feels or sees, you pretty much superimpose your own content on the environment. That's domination. Stay with me. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the pine, the box tree together, the beauty to beautify the place of my sanctuary. Not to beautify you. Not to beautify you guys. That's the problem with the church today. There's so much amazing messages from the pulpit everywhere. But all we are doing is pumping up the people to fix themselves, not the kingdom. And pastors have to find ways to manipulate and preach all kinds of messages because essentially the people are taught ownership, not stewardship. And the more ownership people learn, the more difficult it is to flow that value that God passes through them into the church, into the kingdom. No pastor should ever worry about finance if the congregation understands their kingdom financial responsibilities. No pastor needs to talk about tithing and offering and all of that. That should be some low resolution conversation in workers' training. <laughs> By the time we have to come on Sunday and share and share and share about all of that dimension, it's first of all a challenge on the pew. But the, the, the bigger view of that is that the pew takes its own conduct from the instruction from the pulpit. And so it's selective reasoning. When we empower people to think of themselves and at the same level want them to think of us, it's not going to work. They can't think of the kingdom when the wiring says, think of yourself. There's nothing like ownership in scripture. There's nothing called ownership. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, it said, what do you have that you did not receive? He said, if indeed you receive it, why do you boast? What the says, why do you act as if you did not? You know why people don't give tithes? It's very simple. And you can bring all the articulation you want. It's pretty much because you don't know who gave you. You think you work for it. I mean, tell, I don't know anybody who is that wicked. That I come to you right now, and I give you a million naira. Or a million dollars. I give you. You didn't ask for it. I just came, give you a million dollars. Then I took two steps away. And he told me, sir, please, I need $100,000. And I said, you need $100,000? Okay. And that's, can you give me $100,000? I just gave you $1 million. You didn't ask for it. I don't know any human being that would say, sorry, I'm sorry, sir, I cannot give you. I don't know any human being like that. Do you know any human being like that? I don't know. He will, he will give you. Because, yeah, I just give you a million dollars that you didn't ask for. So if I say, five minutes after, after I left, I say, oh, give me $100,000. He will give me joyfully. And then I'll give it to him. And then I say, give me another. I say, ah, I would have loved to give you, but you know my rent. Hey, where were they before I gave you? <laughs> your rent, your school fees, your whatever. Where were they? I just gave you. They were there before I gave you. You see, I have hundred thousand dollars with you anyway. There's no human being like that who will not give. And when people don't give, the problem is they don't know that he gave them in the first place. They think they work for it. So they have a mentality of ownership, not stewardship, because a steward is a custodian. And once you understand that, you know you have everything, yet you have nothing. I call it the ownership of zero. It's an amazing concept. To beautify the place of my sanctuary. I will make the place of my feet glorious, and all the sons of those who are afflicted shall come bowing to you, and all those who despise you shall fall, yada, 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 because of time. Whereas you have been forsaken and forsaken, I went, 
then instead of bronze, gold, instead of iron, silver, yada, 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 the sun shall no longer be your light by day. Nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. For the Lord shall be your everlasting light. And the Lord your God your glory. No longer shall, your sun shall no longer go down. So you don't close shop anymore. You don't close for the day. You don't close business. The most spiritual organ in the human body is your brain. Let me be honest with you. Your brain must be accorded secret respect more than your spirit. Because if that brain malfunctions, your spirit is arrested. You should never despise the blessing of your brain. It's a, very, it's a highly spiritual organ. Even though one of the most despised by spiritual people. So, in James chapter 4 verse 1, it says you do not have because you do not ask. Then he said, you ask and still do not receive because you ask amiss. Then he said, you ask to spend it on your pleasures. And that is why you ask and do not receive. You see, as far as God extending value to you is concerned, the most primary um, precursor to any experience is to understand the why of that exchange. Let's be clear. I'm not passing this value to you for you to be comfortable. You are like a conduit. A pipe does not have any commitment to be wet. He has no faith to be wet. He has no thinking about wetness. He just wants to pass out water to those who are thirsty. That's the job of the pipe. That's what the conduit is doing. But you see, every time he allows that process to occur, a residue of what is passing through to others remains with it. He has no plan to be wet, but whether he likes it or not, whether he has faith or not, it will be wet because it's busy positioning itself to pass out water to those who are thirsty. For he that waters will himself be watered. So success at the level that people like to think about it is not a goal. It's an experience. It's not what you want to create. It's what happens when you focus on what you have to create. And what you have to create is kingdom. And when kingdom, you tell me how your business will be number two to any business if God is really the owner of it. Most of the time when we say God is the owner, we are just passing the test of technicality, not of essence. How is God the owner, by the way? You earn more money than him? You make all the money, you come to church, sit in front and give us one's offering. And people didn't know how much you have in the back room. So the little they see in front that looks like a lot of money, we respect it because we just don't see the back room. But God sees it. And so, who, who is fooling who? This is not doctrine. This is me as a man of God advising you. If you say God is your friend, make it so. For he that must have a friend must show himself friendly. If you say God is the owner, make it so. Don't fool yourself. If you pay yourself $10, pay God 10, 20 If you pay yourself $10, pay God $11. At, first of all, the owner must earn more money than you. I really can't be the owner of your business and you are making more money than me. So if you say God is the owner, give him more. At least a dollar more. A pound more. Have an account. Put his money there. I call it kingdom multiplication account. So that you will never have to think about where the money to fund the kingdom is coming from. It's coming from that account. And when there is any need in the kingdom, all you have to do is go to that account. And every time you go to that account and there's no money there, then God didn't speak to those people to come and meet you. Yes, if God spoke to them, he will fill that account. 
I spend my money in percentages. If you have kingdom account, or call it benevolence account, or call it generosity account, that is the account where you run welfare, economics, and kingdom territorial penetration. How other accounts have education account where you pay for school fees from and you pay your courses from and your seminars, whatever you have to go. Have utilities where you pay all your bills from. I don't believe in saving, so please forgive me. I think every time you save, you are betting against inflation. The money you have is the money you spend. The money you save is not yours. Those who have it will come and take it. Bills, what kind of thing will take the money? The money you really have is the money you spend. I don't know if you saw that meme that went out, don't worry about my future. My future doesn't go anywhere. Spend that money. Any money you have, just spend it. Pure counsel, free of charge. Spending the money is not the problem. It's what you are spending it on. Or spend the money. Be rich in assets. Spend the money. Somebody say, but sir, I've bought the house, I've bought this, I've bought I think, okay, buy a Rolex. So really, you yeah. can cash out at the time. <laughs> <laughs> if you really don't have anything to buy, get a Rolex. Or get a PRJ. You cash out when you're ready. Hello? You can't even will it to your children. If it's good enough, your children's children can get it. If it's good enough, your children's children's children can get it. If you put ten thousand dollars in the account, by next year you will still see figure ten thousand, but it's now nine thousand and something. It's just that you are measuring it by the limits of your eyes. Savings is a bet against inflation. So once you have enough. Particularly if you live in a first world country where there's a lot that has been sorted out. You get bold, I call it adventure capital. And put money out there. Let it work for you. Please, I'm not saying go eat all the money, go to a holiday and just go finish all the money, no. I'm saying multiply that money by investing. Investment would defeat savings any day. And if God has really blessed you and you have your lifestyle for two years in an account, cover it to gold and leave it there. It means that even if everything stops today, it will take two years for it to show. If everything stops, your money stops, everything stops today, two years before it shows, that's fine. From that day on, forget about it. Just start taking territories and finding ideas and expanding your portfolio. But let me leave all of that, man. Let me break it down for the future. But let's be clear about the why. Because everything I'm going to build on that is that you understand the mission in the kingdom. The reason why ideas will flow to people who don't know God is because they will be better shepherds of that idea. The church is filled with hirelings, not shepherds. Because somebody told me, if I, if I share my idea, you know, people, people can steal it. I said, well, it's because you stole it. <laughs> because you stole the idea, you know how ideas can be stolen. So you know if I share this idea, they will steal it as I have been stealing. If you didn't steal the idea, trust me, anybody that is afraid that their ideas will be stolen, go close to them, they stole the idea. I've done the research. I found it. If they didn't steal that particular one, they stole some. So they know how ideas are stolen. And that's their challenge. If you really have an idea, and you are a true, authentic shepherd, even if they steal it, you will not be worried. If they steal it and execute, and it goes to the whole world, you will still be content. Your goal is the multiplication of this idea not who multiplies it. You just want this idea to scale. And even if it is stolen and they did not scale it, that's when you'll be pissed off. 
if they steal it and shepherd it all the way into the world, you'll be excited. That is why God allows sinners to multiply ideas. Because he's not really, maybe he would have loved to give it to his child, but if a sinner is more responsible, he's going to pass it to him. I'm going to break all of that down tomorrow, the science of how that happens. We live in very strange times. These kind of times, we read about them in books. The way we are now is the way people were when the Second World War was ending. We, re we read about it, but we can't feel it. Oh, we're not there. We can't see moving. One of the reasons why I'm fascinated with Germany is because I've read almost everything about the Second World War. I like to go to historical. I was talking to him. I said he lives in Germany. Um, by the way, uh, this guy has been assisting me. Amazing gentleman, one of my strongest proteges in the world. That I to you. Amazing guy. He's me one of him. He lives and works in Germany, but great, great workforce. Um, I have some good people in the room. I met. God bless you for showing up here. You know, madam. Okay. No. I was just going to say I know her. This is not her face, right? No. Okay. Great stuff. And all of those who showed up here, thank you. So, I think I like to, I travel for leisure chasing history. So, I just want to connect the things I've read about and fill them as much as I can. So, I want to go to Germany, you want to see, um, you want to see the concentration camps like Auschwitz, you want to see, you know, you want to see Sebibor in, you want to see, you just want to see history so that some of the things you read can be, can be life to you, more real to you, right? Um, so we are in that moment where baby boomers were, like when the First World War was ending, or when the Berlin Conference had just happened, and colonial masters were going back to their base to arrest it by their decisions. And you can imagine the feelings of the Africans of 1885, and how they had to accept that, you know, um, a part of Benin Kingdom, because there are people in Benin Republic who speak pure Yoruba, like the Yorubas in Lagos or in your, in fact, the Yoruba they speak in Benin Republic is like that they speak in Oyo. So raw, like in Konsi, you know, the raw one, because that's where they are from, really. And then when the, 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 the continent had to be divided, and then people who, Benin Kingdom, had a consulate in Portugal. So the Benin Kingdom, and, and I mean the Oba Benin in Nigeria, was a country. You know the, the, the tallest wall ever built in the world is not the Great Wall of China. It's the Great Wall of Benin. I hope you know. No, you Google it. You'll see it on Wikipedia. And that was a civilization. Street lights were there when, when they had prisons in London here, and we already have criminals. People didn't have doors. People don't shut their doors in Benin City, and it was reported in the press. The paper, the news report, is on Wikipedia. They had street roads and street lights. Right? We had a civilization. What happened to Africa was our education was taken, and we were given the classroom. And Africans don't learn in the classroom. It's not our, in our DNA. We learn through observation and apprenticeship. So we master the craft, not the technicalities around it. We don't need to define it, we just need to do it. And the classroom and the prison system are the same, I hope you know. The classroom was made out of the model for the prisons. Both of them have terms five years in school or five years in jail. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Both of them have a curriculum. By the time you finish school, you'll be this. By the time you're out of jail, you'll be this. Both of them will punish you, you fall out of line. I can give you different, that's with the similarities. So the classroom is pretty much defined to fund and um, protect the thinking of a few, managed by the majority. The more academics you have, the less of yourself you will know. 
except you go to class with a rebellion that questions everything you are learning and put it in perspective so that you think of how to use what you are learning without compromising your own identity. Otherwise, the academics will brand you into a mold that reduces you and promotes your makers, and that is those who design the curriculum. Academics is what you are taught. Education is what you teach yourself. And part of growth is the ability to teach yourself through education. Though superior to both is revelation. Because while academics is what you are taught, education is what you teach yourself, revelation is what is given to you. And while the world has been dominated by education for years, and academic, academics has been the burden of the majority, the next level of dominance will be through revelation. Education is the ability of the human spirit to experience this world, to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in it, and to know the ones to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. Education is the ability of the human spirit to experience his world, to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in it, and to know the ones to embrace amongst those options as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. By that definition, so many people are not educated even with a PhD because they cannot experience their world. When they can do that, they can't question it. When they question it, they can't bet options in it. And even when they can bet options, they don't know the ones to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. And so their PhD is not education. It's just the final stamp that you have gone through the classroom. And that you are now academic qualified, academically qualified to be a slave. You are free when that curriculum is with you, but in perspective to the extent that you now superimpose your originality on that curriculum to create your own way. That is why people have gone out of the curriculum and built empires. Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and you could go on and on. Stay with me. These are not the times to lean on your education because there's a confusion that comes from there. You know when you are confused, when you are confused, you are not in a psychological challenge. When you are confused, you are not, in a, you are not psychologically defective or struggling. Confusion is the inability or unpreparedness or refusal of the human soul to make a decision in the face of options. So when you don't know what to do, you are not confused. You are clueless. That's ignorance. That is, you don't know what to do. In fact, to be confused, you know what to do. You know more than one thing to do. Your confusion is you don't know the one to choose. So you can't be confused without having options. So confused people are not ignorant people. There are people who know more than necessary. So when you are confused, you know so many things to do, you are not able to zero in on the most supreme important option. So Christians are confused most of the time. Because the blessing of the Holy Ghost is the multiplication of options. But the discipline in the Holy Ghost is the ability to choose. Because a wise man, we bring that, he said, ah, I don't have time for all of that, but. So, choice, please stay with me, please. Choice is the instrument to perpetuate your slavery. Real freedom is to be able to compartmentalize that. Stay with me, please. So, when slave trade came, slave trade came to arrest our choice. And the problem with the human condition is to dominate him or to oppress him, you must do it from some, some sort of reverse thinking. The day the human soul knows you are manipulating him, that's the day your control ends. He'll begin to resist you from that day till the day he dies. 
he, he will never stop till you kill him or he gets his freedom. So when slave trade began, what was he doing? He was trying to control our choices, telling us what to do, who to do it with, when to do it. We found out we rejected it. The power center saw our rejection it morphed into colonialism. But colonialism was doing the same thing, controlling our choices, telling us what to do, how to do it, where to do it. We found out again, what did we do? We rejected it. It became military rule in some governments. It became appetite in others. But doing the same thing, controlling our choices. We rejected it again. I don't know if they met, but the power centers have now sat down to say, hmm, to continue to control their choices is not working. We need to do something else. What we need to do now is uh, give them control over their choices. Hire pastors, hire spiritual leaders, hire authority figures, parents, teachers, hire all of them. Let them remind them of their power to choose. Let them teach them of their power to choose. Let them tell them, let nobody take your votes. Let nobody arrest your vote. Not nobody pay for your vote. Let nobody da 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 da. Your choice is your power. Die and compromise your choice. Camp around your choice because we now know that your choice is our instrument to perpetuate your slavery. You camp around your choice. We camp around the options. Because what is the power of your choice to vote, of your power to vote, if you are going to make a choice between two fools? All your intelligence will choose a very good fool <laughs> of two fools. So you control your choices, we control how the options emerge. And when we control how the options, that is why primaries are part, by far more powerful than elections itself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And party administration is by far more powerful than the primaries itself. So when you say that you are involved in politics, you better be in the party administration, you better be involved in, in the primaries, or you are ready too late. No, you don't understand. That if you are ready, you are late. That you are already coming to the party late. Because the election, the, 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 the party administration and the primaries emerge, curate, architect your options for you. With all your power to choose, you are coming to choose what men have chosen. And real power is not partisan. When power is at its highest level, it takes a stake in the options. Whether you choose them or them, you are choosing us. Choose A or B, you are choosing us. We have a stake in A, we have a stake in B. Whether you choose, some say, I don't like Facebook, Instagram is more real. Well, Instagram or Facebook, you are choosing Mark, bottom line. So it's just WhatsApp for me, Mark. Lexus is better. Toyota is everybody's car. Well, Lexus or Toyota, you are choosing the same company. <laughs> Some people say, well, in, particularly, <laughs> so I have to graduate from, D you know, in Nigeria. I don't know if you know, but I'm, I, I, want to, I, need to, I need to have DSTV something. It's good TV. Well, it's the same company. Puke milk or three crowns, same company. I can go on and on. Akura Honda, the same company. I like Akura. It's like, the same company, man. Real power spreads its stake in the options to arrest your choices. Because once the options emerge, your choices are arrested. It doesn't matter what you choose. You choose the custodians of how the options emerge. That is where you have to be. The curation architecture of the options. You are jogging fast into irrelevance in the future if you keep camping around choices. Do you know how many businesses have their business model in the business model of Amazon? That is one company, that is one company that is a perfect representation of power in the future. Because in the future, there are no successful businesses. There are monopolies. 
is either you are a monopoly or you are locked in the expression of a monopoly. Am I speaking to you? But we are underdogs. We are bloody underdogs. The world already mastered this craft. And guess who gave them? God. And please don't even get angry. Just withhold your judgment and come to service tomorrow morning. And get all your friends to come to service. Because I'm going to break that down. Do you know God empowers sinners to do his will? His will. I hope you know that Cyrus in Isaiah was an eating king. And I hope you know he was referred to as Cyrus my anointed. Please don't, don't get it twisted. It's not that deep. If God could speak through a donkey, come on, he could speak through a sinner. A sinner is human. A donkey is a thing. A donkey has no eternity. Anything without eternity is low resolution. And if God could speak through a donkey that has no eternity, don't tell me he can't speak through a drunk. He can speak through a fool. The human condition in any state is better than the spontaneous, instinctive, animalistic condition. In any state. And if God still found the instinctive state of an animal useful to communicate his word, not just to an ordinary man, but to a prophet. The donkey wasn't speaking to citizens. He wasn't speaking to somebody on the floor. The donkey was speaking to, in fact, the Bible says, the madness of the prophet. How much more human beings? You don't pursue your dreams, guys, in the future. It has never been so, but it has been a permitted quantity until now. Going to the future is a duty not to pursue your dreams. You position for them. Goodness and mercy shall not be before you to be pursued all the days of your life. That wasn't written yesterday. That scripture all day long, all years long. Goodness and mercy shall follow you. Dreams are not meant to be pursued. They gravitate towards you. Dreams pursue you. You don't pursue them. You don't pursue dreams. You position for the dreams. The dreams are chasing you. It's like you are looking for what is looking for you. That's confusion. That means that the dream will get to where you are supposed to be. It won't meet you there. And scripture says he has determined our appointed times and the boundaries of our habitation. If perhaps we grope for him, for in him we live, we move where we have been. He has determined our appointed times and the boundaries of your habitation. So your destiny is geography sensitive. You are supposed to be in place. why you just can't go to any church. You just can't jump from church to church because they are preaching the word of God there. They will preach the word of God there and you will still starve to death. Because that's not your environment. Because of the need to feed, apple will not grow in Accra. Just because people are hungry there. God will serve them what can grow there. Hello, come on now, am I talking to you? It's as simple as that. So you have to find your own environment. Because it's an environment for you. You just can't move from house on the rock to power of the rock. It's not going to happen. There's a food being served for a particular reason, for a particular purpose, for a particular level of nourishment, for a particular type of destiny. Destiny is location sensitive. You, so, once you understand all of these things I'm talking about, you get your mission clear. Your mission is one. For this purpose, the Son of Man was made manifest. Not for these purposes. Not for these many agendas. For this purpose, the Son of Man was made manifest. To do what? To destroy the works of the enemy. So, you are not permitted to be strategic. Because strategic, being strategic can create win-win. The enemy of your soul is not about win-win. You are permitted to be stratagemic. Stratagem is superior to strategy. Everything in strategy is in stratagem. But there are things and components in stratagem that does not exist in strategy. S-T-R-A-T-A-G-E-M. 
that is the one that is operated by God and operated by the devil. Stratagem is a plot to eliminate an adversary, not to accommodate him. Eliminate. That's what is operation in war. So when Iraq, when Greece, I mean, um, Ukraine is fighting Russia, that is stratagem. On their war table, in their war rooms, is stratagem, not strategy. Every time people talk strategy, it's just, it's just you see, there are conversations that are bent to flow to the majority to keep them small. When a journalist in America goes to a battlefront, nearly lost his life or her life, and came back with a story, and they are being rewarded with an award for some type of journalism, and his African counterpart is being given the same award for running the streets or reporting some silly ideas, and is being given the same award that somebody that nearly lost a life is being given. We rejoice with him that he has, is getting an award. What we miss is that this one in America is being observed by people in his own geography, and that one too is being observed by people in his own geography. The bar of excellence for the people observing this one is get it, die for it if necessary. The bar for those observing this one is you don't have to do too much. Just hang in there, do little, and you have it. So with that award, they are raising, the, they are determining the ceiling for the protégés, the mentees, and the observers of this person. They are raising mediocrity as your highest standard of excellence, while they are perpetuating excellence as the only way to go here. If I am that gentleman and I've done that twice in my life, I reject the award. I say, I've not done enough. Don't kill my people before they appear. Don't reward me for this. What have I done? Hey, are you here? And that's a tough thing to make because if I accept that award, we're not even going to praise me. They're going to, oh, 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 oh. Someone called me the other day and said, I'm, I'm competing in an award. I want you to please vote for me. I said, I'm sorry. I can't do that. Because it means that you're not going to qualify because you are the best. You're going to qualify because you are the one that could make the lightest noise to connect to the soul and the emotions of people. That's mediocrity. How do you do that? When you win the real award like Nobel, you don't vote. They vote you based on the character of your work, based on the impact of your work. And when you have to be the one that means to fight for your award, that's mediocrity. Someone said they want to give me an award and I have to pay for a page of advert. I said, I don't deserve it. I've not worked hard enough, please. I don't want that kind of award. I don't need to pay for nothing. When my work speaks loudly enough, you will fix an appointment and do all you can. The head of ISIS at a point, one Time Magazine most influential person of the year. I, I, I laughed, I said, I hope they will be there when it comes to collect their award. <laughs> but the idea is this, an evil man doing his own evil. They still give him the idea, the award. But let's leave that. The first level of responsibility is to understand that the future has to represent God's kingdom. It's about God's kingdom. Every value flowing into your life is about God's kingdom. God is not protecting ideas in the future. He's protecting his creation. And you get up be in it or protecting it. Let me prophesy to you what God said to me in 2018. And if anyone has listened to me between 2018 and now, you will have heard me say this countless times. By 2030, four things are going to happen in the world. By 2050, it will be cemented in the world. The first one is the fading of powers and voices as you have known. The fading of powers and voices as you have known. It's simple. The future is 30. Simple. Add 30 years to anybody breathing today on earth from age 1 to whatever age. They are either full-blown adults or they are the departure lounge of life ready to take the flight or they have taken it. If you are 1, be 31. If you are 10, you'll be 40. 
If you are 20, you'll be 50. If you are 30, you'll be 60. If you are 40, you'll be 70. If you are 50, you'll be 80. If you are 60, you'll be 90. How many 90 year olds do you know around you? So most likely, you'll be gone. If you are 70, you'll be 100. Come on. You'll be gone. If you are 60, you'll be 90. If you are 58, you'll be 88. Your five-year-old son will be 35. Your 10-year-old will be 40. Your 20-year-old will be 50. Where do you think you are going to be? Your 20-year-old will be 50. I gave, my, I gave back to my son in my 40s. If I live up to 80, I will still live in this world as a 30-something-year-old young man. People always ask me, why do you do some things? I said, no, I don't have time. I gave back quite late. So I need to have a second child. I don't have time. I have only one. I have, only, I have just one. I'm going to just, the one is enough. I don't have time to do two. I'm not looking forward to it. At the right time, probably by, before the end of next year, we'll have wrapped up our commitment to adopt an eight-year-old. And it's math. It couldn't have been six. It has to be eight. I've planned it. Because I have to be alive and well and strong to contribute. And to live in that child, not houses, not shoes, but strength of character and weight of thinking. And that takes a working, talking relationship, not gifts. And I have to be alive to do that. And I have to be strong, not on the sick bed, passing weak instructions, confused in my own mind. You see what I'm saying? Someone said, Why are you vegan? I said, Why am I vegan? I'm doing all I can do as man. Everything is in the hand of God, but I'm doing all I can do as man. <laughs> if anything happens to me, I don't want to blame myself. Whatever happens after best effort is God's will. Are, you, are we all here? Yes. The rise, the fading of powers and voices as you have known. Bill Clinton, gone in 30 years. Donald Trump, gone. Joe Biden, gone. Hillary Clinton, gone. Buhari, gone. Babangida, gone. Obasanjo, gone. Tinubu, gone. Atiku, gone. You can go on and on. Across the world, everyone is gone by 2030. Big actors, culture shapers. We don't have it every time. Where everybody's going at the same time. Some young people came to me and said, sir, we need to plan the future. We need to organize. I said, no. Young people, you don't need agitation. You need positioning. Nature is in charge. Everyone you hate is going. <laughs> Everybody. Everyone you hate, they are all going. Whether they like it or not. There is a button called the sting of death. It's on fire right now. It's taking out everybody. Everybody's going. So don't fight the problem. Decide it. You don't need to go wrestle them. They are going. So what will you do? Young people have always messed up. I told some African leader. I said, between 1950 and 1960, there was no young man. There was no old man in, in African politics. Mm -hmm. Not one old man. Yeah. They were in their 20s. 20-something-year-olds were presidents. 30-year-olds mm -hmm. were presidents. Fast track to 60 years after. The same young people became the old people you are angry with. Don't tell me we need young men. They are young fools, as they are old fools. We don't need young or old, and we don't need to reject young or old. We need people, human beings with their head on their shoulders. Young or old. Are we clear? So, if what I've said is true, and by God, by God's spirit, I kid you not, it's true. The question should be, what are you going to do? Who are you going to be? To position for this time that I discussed. It's true for enterprise, for businesses. Over 70% of the Fortune 500 companies alive in 1980 are no longer alive today. Fortune 500 companies. So what do you think? The next thing that was going to happen at the back of that, parallel to that, is the rise of powers and voices as you are yet to know. 
The first one is the fading of powers and voices, as you have known. The next one, parallel to that, is the rise of powers and voices, as you are yet to know. Ah, let me just say that for whatever is worth, for one second, before you get angry. Even in the church, both are true. Even in the church, the fading of powers and voices, as we have known, the rise of powers and voices, as we are yet to know. Let me leave that there. But that's true for everybody, even in the church. As a matter of fact, can I shock you? It starts in the church. It always starts in the church before it goes to the culture. Every time. From 1517, mathematical reformation that ended in 2017, 500 years, to the 500 years that began to count from 2017, from the great schism, to, to it's 500 years every time. It starts in the church. That mathematical reformation gave us democracy as we know it. Gave us little governments as we know it. Gave us open inquiry as we know it today. Is that movement. It always starts in the church before the culture. And that's scriptural. So it started already. Then, the rise of underdogs. No name boys and girls rising to prominence in the future. No name boys and girls in every African country. Now. In Nigeria today, as I speak to you, there's an American growing up at the back of your street. His name is Fatai or Kunle, or it's not Fred Skin. He's Jaye or Balubo or Wachuku something. Because he was born in America by a middle class parent who took him back home. So Americans have allowed Americans to grow up everywhere because white is a minority in the future. And whites cannot be traveling everywhere. White has to stay at home. And we need, and they have been kidnapped outside too because they are too obvious. So the next American going to Lagos should be black. His name should be Fatai. <laughs> and he asked for the American power, and the American rights going with him. And an American is growing in every street, in every corner. And a new army of Americans with access to credit, power of the currency, quality of life, equal opportunities, enabling the environment, all behind him. Because those five are the definition of th first world economy. And third world economy is the opposite of the five. So when you say Ghana, What's missing is not just names or color, is access to credit, zero. Power of the currency, zero. Enabling the environment, zero. Quality of life, zero. Equal opportunity, zero. That's third world. First world is the opposite. And the country with the most of those five, when aggregated, is the superpower. Quality of life is better in Canada, even in the UK, than in America. So on that great UK wins, Canada can win. But when it comes to access to credit, when it comes to power of the currency, when it comes to equal opportunities, America stands tall. Insurance looks like fraud in America. As a matter of fact, <laughs> healthcare looks like fraud and business. True? It is. But those other three dwarfs every other country. Am I talking to you? There are indices I can build and build and build on that. But understand that there's a rise of underdogs. They are rising in five areas. They are going to shape the way we love through products and ideas, philosophies and ideologies. They are going to shape the way we work through products and ideas and tech and ideologies and philosophies. They are going to impact on the way we live the way we play and the way we die. Every time you hear culture shaping, that's the meaning. The way we live, the way we love, the way we walk, the way we play, the way we die. That's culture shaping. Any idea you have, please, before you start investing, ask yourself, what does it have to do with these five areas? If it has nothing to do at a scale, at a high scale level, it's not in the future. You are jogging very hard with determination into irrelevance. The future has to be about these five things. That is the game changer. Call it Facebook. Call it Instagram. Call it DoorDash. Call it Uber. Call it, they are all impacting on one, two, three, four of those five areas. They are impacting on how we love, how we live, how we work, how we play, or how we die. Evangelism in the future 
it's about culture shaping in fact you are free to stop using that word evangelism because that word is not a spiritual word it's english it's a word to describe a movement you see what i'm saying the type the pastor teacher evangelist prophet um apostle they are not spiritual words i hope you know in fact the original language they were documented in is not english right it's greek am i speaking to you so it's not that when you say you are pastor this that you are now in the office if you if you say i am a life shepherd if you funk, if you behave like a pastor you are a pastor if oh you don't the, the pastor is an office not a title so if you act in the office even if your title is life giver you are still in the future and you are still in the fivefold so i can't go to the corporate world and say i'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a prophet nobody's going to listen to me but if i say i'm a futurist they're going to listen to me but i know on the life of that is the prophetic ministry and i've learned and mastered by the grace of god how to communicate that in such contemporary way that everyone everywhere can receive it faith or out of faith i'm in boardrooms prophesying and they are listening to a futurist come on now I'm telling them the life of a product. I'm telling them this market does not exist. I'm telling people the future of real estate. <laughs> if I have time, I'll tell you the future of real estate. You calm down. <laughs> you really calm down. I'll tell you the future of construction. I'll tell you the future of mobility. I'll tell you the future of healthcare. I'll tell you the future of healing. Healing is not in the future. The healing ministry is not in the future. Forgive me. <laughs> Please, let me be clear. When we left the stone age, stone did not finish in the world. We just had better ways of doing things. We still have stones today, but we've left the stone age. So when I say there's no healing in the future, I'm not saying there will be no healing. There will be healing, but it won't scale. It won't scale. It's like there are still horses, but who's going to ride it from Lagos to, 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 to London? <laughs> If you can ride a horse from Lagos to London in 2022, you will get to the Guinness Book of Records. Are we clear? No, no, it's true. Get to the Book of Records. But that's not going to determine life for anybody. Nobody's going to try to copy you. That means the idea is good for you. It can never scale. We're talking, when we talk about culture, we're talking about things that can scale. Because through, through, eh. So, right now, human parts are being grown. And through, ah, should I bother you with that? But quite frankly, we are going to be able to produce spare parts in the future. We are producing human spare parts right now. And so, when you have your spare part, if we can preserve, ah, so we can recreate your, your, the only thing science cannot create till Jesus come is breath. Don't get angry, God permitted it. There's nothing else science cannot create apart from the human breath. And can I shock you? If the Lord tarries, they will find the properties. It's God that gave it to them. God gave it to mankind. He said, have dominion over everything. I made you in my image, in my likeness. He said, if they unite every time, nothing they imagine, they will tell from them. Nothing. So put bread there, is there. Once they find that level of collaboration and investment, they will find it. If the Lord tarries. The key is that the Lord will tarry on his clock and you come down and shut everything down and shift it to a new place. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, every agenda happening now is about the kingdom. Don't be fooled and don't be worried about COVID, earthquakes, kidnaps, terrorism, war in Ukraine. They are all shaping us into that final stage of the rise of the church. Four things I said. That's the fourth thing. The next 10 years, we see the rise of the church in ways unimaginable. But that rise will not come from evangelism with tracts and crusades as you know it. It will come through domination in the marketplace. You will find Zion rising to a state where it is the chief of all the mountains with other mountains on ground. <clears throat> and people streaming to Zion to say, show us your ways. Show us your way. And whoever 
controls um, controls what's that scripture in Isaiah 2 the lost mountain shall be head of all the mountains and the water shall stream to it and can somebody give me that scripture I just lost the sentence there um, the law shall go from, from Zion you don't control the law if you don't own the economy and once laws are going forth from Zion Zion is at its highest place economically you're going to see that happen through products and ideas there are Christians who speak in tongues who will give you the next level of the internet. There are human beings, Christians who live who will give you the next level of social media. You find people giving you the next level of markets and industries. Tongue speaking Christian dominating the fashion space, creating music at a level unimagined, unprecedented genres of music that are completely received only by a funny sound in the middle of the night. Where we have to spend maybe another two years on a keyboard to even understand the key that came right there and by the time it's out the whole world is streaming to it and grammys are coming in at a level unimaginable and that person comes on cnn to say jesus is lord because jesus is lord on cnn is more powerful than jesus is lord in five million churches combined and cnn will not interview you because you want to be interviewed they will interview you because of the weight of your exploits that unlock their humility and curiosity to pursue your source. And when your the dimension you are operating in forces them, not because they want to, but because you are the news. And nothing is the news if it's not new. And that's not a rhyme, it's true. You can't come in 2022 and say, Barack Obama is president. They will look at you like, hey, because it's not new. To be news, it has to be new. And the spirit of new is the Holy Ghost living on your inside. Guys, never in the history of mankind have we been better positioned than we are today. The habits you must sustain. Whatever you do, collapse the middleman. If you are in enterprise, collapse the middleman in your business. Collapse the middleman. Eliminate the middleman. You want to be a billionaire? Eliminate the middleman. Eliminate the middleman and you are looking at billions in front of you. If you can do that successfully to any idea today, you are looking at billions in front of you. Call it Amazon. Call it Samsung. Call it DoorDash. Call it Uber. Call it Twitter. Call it Airbnb. These are guys who successfully eliminated the middleman. I want to take the middleman out. You are looking at billions of dollars. Then go online. In the future, I kid you not, in the future, anything that is not on life, online has no life. I don't care what you sell, shoes, garment, socks, watch, church, hospital, go online. Online is the line. That is the open line. That is the lifeline. To remain in the future offline used to be the front door to what you do no matter what you do online at best was back door to what you do today and in the future is the reverse we flipped it online is the front door to what you do offline is the back door to what you do so if you are a common now hospital before now, 10 years ago, you were a hospital that uses technology to treat people. But your technological use and compliance was limited to X-ray machines, to MRI machines, to you know, stethoscope, to injection. So our technology. Technology is anything that brings speed, ease, and affordability. That's tech. So whether it's injection or it's stethoscope, it's technology. That's your use. You see, before now, you were a hospital using technology to treat people. Now, you are first of all a tech organization that is treating people. You are no longer a hospital using tech. You are tech. Every organization in the future is a tech organization doing things. First of all, it keeps you nimble. Let me give you a perfect case study. Amazon again. I love Amazon because they represent the spirit of the future, even the spirit of expression in Antichrist days. 
I don't have time to explain that to you. I don't, I'm not saying it's Antichrist. I'm saying that business model will live, even when the Antichrist is here, the business model will still be on ground. So, Amazon began as a bookstore. Amazon began as a bookstore. But because they were a tech, they were not a bookstore, they were bookstores at that time who were bookstores that used technology. Maybe they had a website. Maybe a bookstore that had a website. That's not Amazon. Amazon was not a bookstore that has a website. Amazon was a website. It was a website that was selling books. And because it was a website selling books, it's like a factory making water. If you are a factory producing water, add plus or minus a few equipment, you could start making juice. You could start making wine. You could start making beer. You could start making all kinds of fluid and beverages because you already have the machinery I've been issued that can expand into that. So if you have a machinery producing water, that same machinery can produce a lot of other fluid. So you only need capacity to produce more, and without adding too much, you can continue to expand on that range. In the same way, when you are a tech organization doing whatever, like Amazon was a tech company doing books, it was easy for them to dominate the book industry, master it, become a monopoly there, then added CD, then downloads, then all kinds of things. Now you could sell anything, underwear, Anything on Amazon, microphone, keyboard, anything, cream, anything, go anything on Amazon. That is what it means to be a tech company doing one thing. It keeps you nimble, elastic, to stretch to any level. But most importantly, it gives you the power to run low cost, dominate your market, become a monopoly, and then conquer more territories. Most importantly, it gives you the ability to earn and to receive capacity beyond the limits of your geography. If you make money today and you are only rewarded within the limits of your geography, you are jogging to irrelevance. You must have the capacity to position in such a way that people in Gambia, Conakry, Lagos, New York, Dallas, um, Paris, Belgium can send you resources. You should be able to sit on one spot and attract purchasing power from all over the world and bring it to headquarters in Westminster or headquarters in Conakry, or headquarters in Abuja, or headquarters in New York, or in Dallas, from one spot. ISIS did that. I'm sorry to use an evil example, but ISIS did not have training head of marketing. You know, they, they, they were not running around with business cards. They were not doing PowerPoints. On one spot, from a website, they were recruiting doctors. Don't forget, they're not recruiting them to come and get a better job. They recruit them to come and sign up for the possibility of losing their lives. And people were signing up. It was so ideological that some of the best, they were not attracting people from Nigeria or, or, or from Sudan. They were attracting professionals from London, from Paris, from Belgium, from America, from first world countries who were ideologically stereotyped to ignore the weight of their civilization and accept responsibility for a failed, flawed, and primitive idea that would end up in their termination of existence. They didn't mind. That's why I laugh when I see the handlers of the gospel and how they curate the messages of the gospel. So weak, Coca-Cola is doing better. You have to construct your message though. Are you getting the layers I'm laying? Ideologically. There's no room for philosophy in the future. Believe me. There's not one room, I'll end in two minutes. There's no room for philosophy in the future. Just in case you don't know, philosophy has never changed the world. Never. Go read it. I'm giving you a fact. Philosophy has never changed anything in the world. Philosophy is romance with truth. It's never the truth. And never enough to make a change. The king philosopher committed suicide. I hope you know. Socrates. So that's the height of philosophy. If, if the greatest philosopher committed suicide, there's not much in it. What has changed the world for good or unto evil is ideology. Nazism, ideology. Capitalism, ideology. Democracy, communism. Um, let's go. Terrorism. Christianity. Islam. Buddhism. Ideology. Those are the things that have changed the world. <laughs> Let me shock you, just, like, just in case you don't know. Google is not philosophical. It's ideological. Do you know there are people who have formed themselves into a religion called Googlers? Who worship Google? Whose assumption is that whatever question they ask Google, they get answers immediately, unlike when they ask God? 
No, I'm giving you fact. No, I'm giving you fact. I'm giving you fact. Because what they represent is not is renting a space in your head. Google has rented a space in your head and governs your thinking and your you can do that without Google. And Amazon is doing the same thing. Have you seen the queues people go through to receive the next iPhone? And you think that's just a phone? That's an ideology right there. People are locked in emotionally to that. They will queue for days to be the first owners of the iPhone. These are products, man. Don't forget. They're coming to spend their money. They're not rewarded. They're not fed. They bring their food. They camp like they are, they are camping in a retreat. Just to receive the next level of a phone that has no difference between iPhone 12. And, there's no difference. Yeah. Apart from some silly side, because I took time to call Apple. <laughs> so please, I need to understand. What is the difference between this phone and this phone? Hey, you know, maybe we just adjusted it. What? <laughs> But guess what? I still bought it. <laughs> I'm locked in. Because I need it. Everything I have, credit card, security, bank, software, iPhone. User friendliness, my work, my notes, Samsung. That's what both of them do. Are we on the same page? I don't mind such colonization. I have work to do. It will, it will only pleasure me more if a tongue-speaking Christian who understands kingdom responsibility owns this or owns this as a company. It will pleasure me more if six people on the board of Samsung come to House on the Rock or go to some life church somewhere understanding kingdom penetration and market penetration and culture shaping. Just imagine if the board members in, in Microsoft born again Christians who understand what we are talking about today. Islam will have, do you know what Microsoft did in Nigeria? Take, in Africa? Taking out polio from nations. Have you ever read the Bill and Melinda Gates newsletter before? Yearly newsletter. Read it once. If they didn't tell you who was writing, you would, it must be the UN Secretary General. Because that was a problem they are solving. It's one of nations. Do you know that? Do you know? Elon Musk is richer than the whole of Zambia. The whole of the economy of Zambia is about $20 billion. There are many people richer than that. I can go on and on. That includes Nigeria. There are individuals, there are individuals in the world today that are more prosperous, maybe about six of them, than the whole of Africa. Beat that. That's when somebody wants to come out and say, I'm a billionaire. I'm a millionaire. I drive a Rolls Royce. Really? You drive a Rolls Royce? So what, what, should, what should we do? We should really sing a song? Or what should we do, really? You drive a Rolls Royce in the world, you are like an ant in the world. Somebody owns that company making the Rolls Royce. What about that? You fly business class, and so what? Somebody owns the plane. Somebody owns Boeing. You just fly business class in Boeing. Somebody owns the entire company. Come on now. The entire company. Somebody said, I'm doing so, so sales on Amazon, fantastic, continue. But somebody owns Amazon. You can choose the resolution you want to tie in. Low resolution or the highest resolution. In God and in the future, only the highest is available. Think this way. Have I helped you? Take this message again and begin to dimension it down. I can go on and on. There's new money for everybody sitting here. New money. In the future, new money. There are new markets, new industries. I told, I told an HR consultant. I said, have you studied distraction management? He said, no. I said, take it. Find, find a course in it. Because in the future, that's a powerful gift. That's a powerful skill. Because in the future, this is luxury. The most powerful component in the future, in the whole world, is not gold or uranium or crude oil. It's attention. Mm -hmm. Giving it and getting it is the most crucial. Touch is a privilege in the future. People are going to be lost on their phones. People are going to be dumb zombies walking around on one spot. We need an entire industry. The structure mark management will be a major, powerful, powerful skill in the future. So if you're a consultant managing human beings, that's a good area to begin to position for. I'm telling you, a lot will shift there for you. The idea is new money waits you too. Right now, 
there are five questions to ask yourself. The first one is, where's my new money? Two, who is holding it? When I say who is holding it, I don't mean one person. I mean what demography, what individuals, what markets, how old are they, how young are they, where do they eat, what do they wear, where do they go, where do they congregate, what are their likes, what are their dislikes. Where's your new money? Who is holding it? How do you reach them? How do you reach them? If you reach them, what do you say? What's your narrative? If you know what to say, how do you say it? You need a podcast? Or you need a new website? Or some digital marketing instrument? How do you say it? The future belongs to only two generations. Gen Z and Gen Alpha. They are the future workforce. They are the future market. So how do you position for them? So let's begin to think bigger. But the beginning of all of this, before you get to all of this, remember the why. Align with the kingdom. And these juices flows to you naturally. I hope I've helped you. God bless you.